Welcome. Good morning. I am Kira Epstein. I'm the program coordinator at the New School at Commonweal, and I'm here today with our host, the Rabbi Erwin Keller, to welcome Aiden Van Noppen to the New School. You can find all of our listings as well as all of our event recordings on our website at tns.commonweal.org. We're recording this conversation and we'll have produced audio and video files available on our website. You can also find and subscribe to get all of our recordings on SoundCloud, YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Ken Adams is behind the scenes, as always, helping us with production. Thank you, Ken. And now we are ready to begin. Erwin Keller and Aiden Van Noppen, welcome to the new school at Commonweal. Thank you so much, Kira. Good to be here and good to have all of you here in the room today. And um, I am thrilled to get to be the host for this conversation, for um, creating technology worthy of the human spirit. I'd like to introduce Aiden Van Noppen. Aiden is a seeker, a thinker, an organizer, a visionary, a strategist, and a big heart. She's the founder and executive director of Mobius, which is a collaboration between leading neuroscientists, meditation teachers, and technologists to bring into manifestation digital technology that enhances our individual and collective well-being. Before Mobius, Aiden was the resident fellow at Harvard Divinity School, focusing on the intersection of tech, ethics, and spirituality. Aiden worked in the Obama administration as senior advisor to the U.S. chief technology officer, developing programs that apply tech as a tool for social and economic justice. Aiden also has background working in housing and urban development, social enterprise and impact investing, affordable housing in India, and poverty alleviation in Kenya. Her work has been featured in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Wired, and elsewhere. It's a thrill to have you here with us today, Aiden. Welcome. Thank you, Erwin. You have such um, a fascinating backstory, such such an interesting background, and I, um, I'm afraid that if we if we start right in with all of our concerns about technology, we will never get around to how interesting Aiden Van Noppen is. Um, so I was hoping that you could start us off by telling us a bit about your background and what brought you to the work that you're doing now. Sure. Thanks, Erwin. And I'll just say that was um, one of the best introductions and I've ever been given. So thank you for that. Um, it's wonderful to have um, all of you on the call. Thank you for being here. Um, I grew up in North Carolina. Um, I have parents who their whole life have been dedicated to um, to working in service of justice and protecting the environment. And so I was um, surrounded throughout my whole childhood by people, their friends, them. Some of their friends are actually on this call, but who were doing the same. And um, I thought that all adults in the world just worked for nonprofits and taught and started schools. And so I feel that I was steeped in um, a value around um, working to make the world a better place. And I'm so grateful for that. So I also want to um, give credit to, to my parents and to the community that raised me um, for some of this work I'm doing now. So um, I also, uh, when I was a kid, I, I had a really rich spiritual life from a young age and that, that really has influenced my story and my work now. So I grew up Jewish in North Carolina, um, where there weren't that many of us. So it was a pretty significant part of my identity. And then when I was in high school, I joined a teen Buddhist, um, Sangha and so started meditating, um, and, uh, became, among the ranks of Jubus, <laughs> as we call them. And there are many of us out here in the Bay Area, so certainly not um, alone in that identity. But um, that has been an important part of my life uh, for a very, very long time. So moving on from childhood, I, as Erwin said, I started my career in international poverty alleviation, um, living in India and in Kenya and working with people who live in slums to improve their living conditions. Um, Doing this because was, this was the expected direction of someone in your family. Right, exactly. <laughs> that was certainly related. Um, yeah, and I, um, while that work was incredibly 
rewarding, incredibly rewarding. Um, it began to feel like there was a way in which um, it wasn't entirely responsible for me to be doing that work because I had such a surface level understanding of the local context and the local culture. Um, and I decided that I wanted to come back and work on poverty in the U.S. And so um, the timing lined up with the Obama administration. I came back, moved to D.C., um, joined the administration, initially working um, on a startup initiative within government that was created by Obama because of his background as a community organizer. And he recognized that um, their the federal government was the worst in some ways at supporting the places that needed our help the most. And so we were really partnering with places like Flint and Baltimore and Detroit. Um, but while I was doing that work, it became really clear to me that we weren't taking advantage of all of the tools we have available to us in the 21st century. And here, here we have incredible tools um, that are mostly benefiting wealthy, privileged, mostly white people. And in the meantime, um, not just struggling local governments, but most social justice organizations, most local poverty allevi alleviation organizations were kind of um, not, not using those tools. They weren't necessarily available to help um, accelerate and deepen that work. So I moved over to the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy to develop programs that use tech as a tool for social and economic justice, as Erwin said. Um, and a lot of that work was about creating collaboration um, between people who are really in the trenches doing work um, on local poverty alleviation, um, federal and local governments and technologists, um, and sort of centering the voices of those who really know um, what their challenges are um, to be in really deep collaboration and co-creation with technologists that have the skills to, to create tools that support them. Um, and simultaneously, alongside that work at the White House, I helped start a racially, religiously, um, and economically diverse spiritual community called the Sanctuaries, which is really grounded in the arts as a way to bring people together, um, as well as social justice. Um, so here I had this uh, part of my life that was around building deep community across difference, very much in person, um, and then using tech as a tool for good at a really um, significant uh, large scale. And as Erwin knows, then out of the blue, I had a major health crisis. I had a cerebral hemorrhage um, when I was 27. And at that time, I realized how unbelievably essential um, my own spiritual practice and spiritual life was. And so lying in a hospital bed, having the doctor come in and say, you have a mass on your brain that's bled and we're sending you to the neurosurgery department. Um, in that instant, it was like all my practices kicked in. Um, luckily, I didn't have to have brain surgery until six months later and it went fine and I'm doing great. Um, but, but it really allowed for this sort of rush of gratitude, of pres presence, of awe that I ever got to be alive. And so like many people who have a near-death experience, it was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not necessarily being true to um, my deeper calling, my deeper purpose. Um, and I had kind of a bifurcation of my spiritual, my spiritual life and working sort of in service of the inner and then the work I was doing at the White House that was um, supporting people's outer conditions of their lives. And so um, I was like, you know, well, what, <laughs> what does this mean for my career and my life when I want to align this community building I'm doing my own spiritual life and um, in the context of the digital age? And so then I was like, well, do I have to go to divinity school? But I'm Jewish, but what do you know, like, what does this mean? And um, anyway, long story short, sure enough, I went and after the Obama administration ended, um, spent a year doing a fellowship at Harvard Divinity School, um, where I really went in with a question of how do we build community that bridges across difference in the context of the digital age? Building off of my work, um, uh, start helping to start and grow the sanctuaries, but also this was right after Trump was elected and just the division in our country was so clear and the way that tech fuels division was so clear. Yet I believed that it we could do the opposite. What if tech brought us together across difference? Um, and pretty soon after getting to the divinity school, it was really clear to me that there was a deeper problem in the tech sector, which is whose voices are helping to shape it and what kind of wisdom and knowledge is valued. Um, here I was sitting at this institution that was dedicated to um, ancient wisdom, to training people on how to care for our spiritual and emotional 
well-being as individuals and communities. And then down the street at the MIT Media Lab, they're literally creating the future of what it means to be human. And right. nobody is sitting around waiting for the next app from Harvard Divinity School. No, although the tech policy people at Harvard Law School came to me early and they were like, Aiden, can we talk to somebody at Divinity School? Because we're trying to figure out how to define what it means to be human from a legal perspective, because when an algorithm writes a piece of music, does, who gets the IP? Is it the person who wrote the algorithm? Or, you know, so they were starting to recognize like, wow, our humanity is really integrated with these are questions that maybe other people may um, may have answers to. And and yet, similarly, even, and yet, and yet that that question, that question is also driven by um, driven by a profit motive, right? Who gets the who gets the credit, meaning who gets the royalties? Very good point. Yes, absolutely. Um, which I'm sure we will touch on significantly yes. throughout this conversation. Um, yeah. And so I started um, doing these like workshops and mashups between um, faith leaders from across a range of traditions and technologists who were asking questions like, how do we bring people together across their shared humanity on Twitter? <laughs> and mm -hmm. it was fascinating. Um, and I really knew that I wanted to do work coming out of the Divinity School on that um, on that topic of how do we bring ancient wisdom as well as the latest science into the design of technology that is quite literally the portal through which we're experiencing so many aspects of our lives as human beings. Um, and so midway through that year, I got a phone call from somebody that said, do you know these meditation teachers, Jack Kornfield and Sharon Salzberg? And it turns out that those meditation teachers, I had been practicing in that tradition since high school and these are, well-known meditation teachers um, who really helped to popularize Buddhism in the West. And um, turns out they were trying to also explore how do they help bring their um, wisdom and knowledge and the wisdom and knowledge of their community to help um, technology be a force for compassion in the world. And so I came out to the Bay Area and teamed up with them and um, started Mobius. Um, and that was really the origin of it. And We've had a couple different iterations um, since then, which I'm excited to speak speak about. But I'll stop there because that's um, yeah. So uh, I teamed. I came to the Bay Area and teamed up with them. Even even that is something that probably needs to be unpacked a little bit more because not everyone gets a gets a phone call suggesting you know those two people, <laughs> and then the next yeah. sentence is so we teamed up. So how did that how did that happen? And uh, what what were they what were they looking for? Where were they at in their thinking? And what did you bring to it? Yeah, that's a great question. So what had happened was um, Jack and a neuroscientist named Richie Davidson, who was really um, one of the first neuroscientists to put monks in MRIs and say, what happens to their brains when they meditate and do compassion practices? Um, they had convened a group of about 20 of their peers that spanned from the science to the contemplative practices. And um, they were all engaging with this question of how they might collectively help support technology to um, increase compassion. And they were, they were like, we don't know how, there's no one to lead us in this, put us to work, <laughs> was basically the charge. It was very broad. There was, it was like, I mean, people who were close to me in that time can tell you that I was like, where do we begin? Oh my gosh, this is like the most exciting and um, uh, most broad, um, charge. Uh, and so it was really a, um, yeah, a real adventure in um, figuring out what collaboration with them meant. And over, over the years, um, we experimented with a couple different things. At first, we were really focused on um, almost like advising engagements of helping to bring those folks and their wider networks into, um, into tech companies to help inform product. Um, and design decisions. So not just like bring in Jack to do a meditation, but, you know, really ask like, what should we do when Alexa is on the other side of somebody's suicidal plea, for example. Um, and we really broadened though the circle of people because um, it was very important to me to also have um, much greater diversity within that group um, along a number of different lines. And so now um, our network really includes a lot of folks that are um, steeped in tech as a tool for racial justice and um, economic justice and uh, people who come from a lot of different disciplines. And so it's a lot of it is really about serving as a bridge to um, to perspectives that uh, 
to those who have deep, deep perspectives on how to care for our humanity who aren't typically um, helping to shape technology. So it's brought in way beyond that group. And that group has continued to be really core and super supportive and exciting to work with also. I, I actually want to back up to just a phrase that came out of your mouth, just to sit with it and luxuriate in it for a moment, which was technology um, to increase compassion. Was that the phrase you used? It just so jumped out at me um, as something I, something I never think about. I, I never think about um, uh, technology. You know, like many people, I've seen you know that movie, the Social Dilemma. Right, and I've become very, very aware of um, the the um, you know the capitalistic trends that that push technology, the and um, and becoming sort of a my own becoming a commodity in the tech world, um, my attention and my time and my focus, and I've become so wary of algorithms. I look over my shoulder for algorithms, and so I've I've sunk into such a such a uh, kind of a cynical view of technology being something that you know that that will only produce compassion if compassion is profitable. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I want to just ask you if you would take some time to, to give us a little bit of a vision of what how technology could be used in ways that um, enhance our spirit, in ways that um, bring about. More, more compassion, and and adding into that, that I know that when I'm at my device doing things, um, I'm in a part of my brain that isn't so open to uh, to compassion, to contemplation, to slowing down. Mm -hmm. So aware both of the the market factors, but also um, sort of the 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 brain science of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's the million dollar question, uh, not to speak about economic value <laughs> in the context of this. Um, yeah, we, so much of what you're pointing to, Erwin, is um, really at the crux of, of this, which is that so many of these technologies, um, perhaps naively, were designed to make our lives better, but the incentives are not aligned with that. <laughs> and so um, Facebook's mission technically is like bring the world closer together and create community. Um, uh, TikTok, who we're doing a lot of work with now, their mission is um, spread creativity and create joy. But when what people are incentivized for, um, whether it's their personal performance review or, you know, holistically as a company is engagement as the primary um, uh, metric, which is how much time we spend on the tools. Of course, there's going to be huge amounts of harm. And as you said, actually, our attention is the most valuable resource on the planet because it is fueling the profit of the most, the wealthiest companies on the planet, um, which also means we have a lot of power as consumers because we are also like quite literally how, how long our eyeballs are on um, these platforms is uh, completely, you know, directly correlated with, um, with how successful they are. But um, I will... We will speak to that more, I'm sure, but I do want to get to your question of um, what do the solutions look like? And I'll just say that um, I deeply believe that we have to address the harms that many of us have seen um, in the social dilemma that we see in our own lives, that we see with kids who are completely addicted to um, their social media. But we all I also believe that we can create a different kind of world. And we won't create that world if we don't imagine it and we don't believe in it. Um, and that's a world where um, there's we see much more um, compassionate leadership on the part of the tech sector, where we see technology that values bringing us together and belonging and truly cultivating joy that's not just frenetic and numbing and all of that. Um, and so, yeah, would this be a good time for me to speak to some of those solutions? Yeah, Erin? please. Oh, please. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'd love to describe solutions in three realms. Um, one is within big tech, which oftentimes is the place that's the most um, uh, vilified for good reason. Um, the second is really new models um, that, that help to show that we can place well-being at the center um, from the outset. And the third is around who actually is building the tech. And so 
in terms of the first, um, these platforms, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, um, they are all of the best and worst parts of humanity amplified. And, um, because we're swimming in the tech all the time, I, and because the harms are so significant, I think we have a tendency to forget some of the really beautiful parts. Um, so as I said, we're working very closely with TikTok right now to help them develop their strategy around how to care for their users' well-being. Um, and that particular app, um, I think, is fascinating. It was actually built on top of, um, or if folks are familiar with TikTok, it's, um, I'll just say real quickly, it's um, short form videos uh, that has taken off hugely in the pandemic. They have 2 billion users around the world, the ma vast majority of whom are young people. And so they really are quite literally shaping the psychological state of the world's youth. And um, so getting this right is extremely significant, not just to the present, but also to our future. Um, and that app was built on top of um, an app called Musical.ly that was created to um, facilitate collaboration of hip hop artists building on top of each other's songs. And so it's really about co-creation collaboration, artistic expression. Um, and while there's a, there are really harmful things that happen on the platform, it still creates that sense of, co it, it is conducive to co-creation across the globe, which has been beautiful in the pandemic when people feel extremely isolated. Um, so I actually wanna show um, a couple of videos that really um, indicate what I mean by this. So can I go ahead and do that? Please. Erwin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rusalema i khayalami i londoloze u hambenami zumangishilana Jerusalem, I So wonderful. You know, it, it makes me, uh, tears well up, you know, the, the, the joy I feel watching it and the closeness to people all over the world is ast astonishing how powerful that is in just those tiny little clips. Yeah. And I'll say, um, there are hundreds of those videos for that song. Yes, um, the Jerusalem which, phenomenon. Yeah, and just there's so many other examples of that um, on this particular platform um, alongside many examples of um, young girl, like young girls having their self-image, like there's a lot of um, body image stuff and eating disorders and things like that that also shows up on that platform. And so you see, like I said, the, the best and worst of humanity amplified and I actually just realized um, the other day that one of the things I think that makes um, what I just showed you really meaningful to me is that I did this work in DC with the sanctuaries, the community I helped start using art as a way to bridge across difference. And it's so powerful because it really does bring us together in our shared humanity in a way that few things do or can. And um, I just, one of the reasons why I'm passionate about doing this work um, is because we're trying to help TikTok figure out how do you um, design to enhance that aspect of the platform um, and to address the harms by creating um, metrics and incentives that really do um, reward that, um, you know, that uh, those more wholesome um, aspects of it. 
I, I want to hear about about the incentives and the metrics. And I just, but first, I just need to ask. So, so TikTok is active, actively interested in enhancing sort of the creative and the the coming together and and trying to limit harms. Yes, so much so. I mean, they're working up against a lot, aka capitalism. Um, but we, as part of this project, we. Um, interviewed 40 people across the com company in 13 different functions. And I will tell you that pretty much every function found this issue to be existential for different <laughs> motivations. Some of them, the motivation was we'll get shut down in more countries if we keep having young people, um, you know, do, quite literally actually dying on the plot. Like there's really bad stuff that can happen on all of these platforms, as we know. Um, others, it's a really deep, care for, um, like on a very genuine level, um, for the well-being of TikTok users. So it's, it really runs the gamut. But when you think long-term about the success of a company like this, whether you're thinking about it from a narrow, um, like, uh, you know, profit driven, um, mindset or more of a mission driven mindset, it's really clear to what they call themselves a second generation tech company, because they don't want to fall into the same mistakes of the Facebooks of the world. Yeah. Um, so there is a lot of motivation. The rub when the rubber hits the road, it's like when they're making the trade-offs, right? With with product or profit. Um, so we're trying to help them. Um, I mean, my I'm passionate about people broadening how we um, think about value. Like ultimately, that's really what's needed. We're not going to create the solutions to these problems in a long-term way that isn't just reactive until we do that piece of it. So what is the, uh, um, so what are the, what are the metrics in, in terms of reestablishing what value is, right? Like I think about Bhutan and gross national happiness, right? And how shocking it is to think about, uh, happiness as, as, as a resource that we can, so uh, that, that we can, um, cultivate and, um, and spread around. So what is the metric here say on TikTok? How do you make that metric dovetail with, with profit motive? Mm -hmm. um, we don't know yet. So what, what we're hoping to do is to help them pilot with um, a couple of different metrics that, um, and ways of measuring well-being that really build off of the best science that we know about how to do that. And so just a very concrete example, we brought in a neuroscientist from the Greater Good Science Center at Berkeley um, just on Wednesday, named Emiliana Simons Thomas, who's one of the leading neuroscientists on the development of pro-social behavior, um, which is really about how people are interacting on the platform and increasing um, generosity and um, connection and compassion, empathy. Um, and she's very steeped in the metrics of how to meaningfully um, many, meaningfully measure um, people's well-being and. Um, and then it's the tech, the tech folks get to say, okay, well, how do we translate this um, onto in, into the technology? And actually, we another person who who we brought in is um, somebody named Arturo Behar, who was the first. Um, he was a director of engineering at Facebook years ago, and was the first person to really start a well being team there that was focused on these, you know, anti bullying and anti harassment and um, suicide prevention and. Um, and his work didn't stick. He left five years ago and his work doesn't exist there anymore because mm. he didn't put in place the right metrics and incentives. And so it relied mm. on a champion, it relied on him. And so he's advising TikTok now on how to learn from that. Um, so that's, so we it, don't know what the metric is basically so, and it depends on the company. So it sounds like a piece of what you're doing is you're bringing to the table the people who are missing from the table. Um, yeah. Because the, yeah. the, the neuroscientists and the um, and the contemplative folks are not generally on the staff of tech companies. Right, that is generally true. Um, and the other piece of what we're doing is building community across the companies, across competitors of people who share this mission to create a more responsible and compassionate and just tech sector. And um, they so they can learn from each other as we're asking these questions or when they're also asking these questions and some of them are farther along on certain questions than others. And so it's, um, it's really beautiful to see what happens when people build trust as human beings that share this mission that cuts it across 
their company loyalty, you know, and is really their loyalty to team humanity. Um, and it's, you know, we're, we're deepening that community. We're experimenting with it. We're expanding it. Um, how do you, how do you make that a safe place for them in this, uh, in this environment of really intense capitalism and, and, uh, uh, intellectual property secrecy, how do you make it possible for people from different, um, se- different pieces of the tech sector to get together and, and talk in this way? It really, like, it really comes down to the fact that every person, um, at these companies is a human being making a decision every day, like making decisions as humans. And so we really, it is the inner and the outer. We are so inspired by Parker Palmer, who really talks about the Mobius strip as showing that there's no separation between the inside and the outside of the shape. And therefore there's no separation between, between our inner life and what we create in the world. Um, whether or not we try to you know, behave like, <laughs> like there is a separation or not. Um, and so we bring people together and we begin with that connection from the inner there's, um, almost always shared spiritual practice meditation. We bring in meditation teachers who are part of our network. Um, I lead meditation, community members lead meditation, and they're sharing from a place of vulnerability about, um, about how hard it is to do this work within the context of companies that aren't set up to reward it. And the people we're working with are in quite significant positions of leadership who oversee thousands of employees and billions of dollars, um, quite literally. Um, but many of them have a lot of, uh, regret about the things that they've been involved with building and, um, regret, regret and grief is a great motivator. Actually, if Mm. you really go into it, um, for courage, right. As Joanna Macy talks about, um, when we really let ourselves go into grief, that's where, um, action, uh, uh, can comes from that's, that's wise and compassionate. And so we try to create the conditions for people to um, share from that place first. And then the shared action comes from that um, trust that we've, that we've built. So a lot of it is really grounded in my background in building um, spiritual community amongst people who maybe wouldn't otherwise trust each other either in when I did the sanctuaries in DC, although it's perhaps the opposite context <laughs> um, from, you know, a racially, religiously, economically diverse arts community um, to some of the most powerful, um, almost entirely wealthy white, pretty much entirely um, folks who, um, so a big part of what we also try to do is to ensure that um, moving forward, we uh, we are actually going to expand the community to move well beyond big tech and well beyond executives in those places to um, support those that are really creating the new solutions, as I spoke about before, um, recognizing that there's a lot of support that can happen that is very important of those who are within big tech. But as we've been talking about, they're within these systems that are um, uh, ultimately unlikely to get out of the harm reduction. They're not going to be most likely unless a huge amount of bravery bravery happens. They're not going to be actually creating a new system that is driven by compassion and generosity. They're going to be tinkering with algorithms to reduce risk of lawsuits. Yeah. Or there's or all of these companies pretty much now have ethics teams that are really made up of people who are deeply concerned about this. Many of them who come from outside of the tech sector um, initially, but, mm. but they're, they're really in a mode of protecting users as opposed to um, like, creative new solutions that, um, that have a different way of, um, articulating value. So if you're, if you're able, if there are no secrets involved, (laughs) uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of the ideas that are starting to emerge now, new, new approaches to technology that excite you. Sure. Um, yeah. So one of the, one of the realms that I'm really excited about is cooperatives, um, cooperative ownership structures of technology, because, um, you know, ultimately, like we said, our attention is the most valuable resource that's providing all of this profit for these, um, massive companies. Um, whereas there's a lot of folks that are experimenting with, um, with more co- cooperative structures where, um, many people are benefiting from the success of the companies. So there's a, 
there's a um, community called Zebras Unite, um, which is thousands of founders around the world that are using cooperative models. Um, and they, um, for example, are, uh, there's a, there's a company called Ampled, which is a cooperatively owned tech platform that allows music artists to be supported by their community with direct recurring payments. And a hundred percent of it is owned by its artists and workers and community. Um, and so the value is going back to them, um, as opposed to being extracted, um, and zebras unite. Um, I love describing why they're called zebras. Uh, some of you may know that um, in the venture capital space and the startups, traditional startup space, there's this term of the unicorn that like all investors are looking for the unicorn that has the hockey stick growth as rapidly as possible. And these folks are like, no, we're, we're not unicorns. We're zebras. We're like a little more quirky, a little more weird, a little more fun. And it takes us longer because we value something else besides the fastest route to a profit. And I just love that in the community element. That's really about collectivity. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, I mean, one of the things that we really want to be doing in the future is lifting up more and more stories um, uh, like that. There's also, um, some of you may use Marco Polo, which is a video messaging app that's um, basically like text messaging, except just sending videos back and forth. Um, and it was started by an entrepreneur named Vlada Bortnik, who's Polish. And um, she and her husband, when they started having kids in the U.S., um, felt that there wasn't a form of connection that they could have with their families. The text message wasn't enough and people weren't really present for their kids life. And so they started this company, um, but they have been so clear that they're not going to create a business model based on selling our data. They're not going to, um, create a business model that's ad advertising based. Um, and they actually did for many years, a generosity based model where users decided how much they wanted to pay for it. And they have millions of users around the world. And they've only just recently created a sort of um, premium uh, way of doing it where you pay um, uh, a subscription. But you can also not have that and just have the basic account. And I just find um, Vlada to be such an inspiration because she stands up to her investors and she says, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to scale as quickly as possible at all costs because I most deeply value um, the, the, you know, the original um, intentions behind this company. So that she's, that's sort of an example of someone who's like one foot in one foot out of the, you know, our existing economic system where she's sort of pushing the edges. Whereas some of these other solutions are really kind of over here creating the new. Um, and our hope is that we can tell those stories and more people jump over into it. It's, there's something beautiful about, I actually haven't heard of this app before, and there's something very beautiful about, uh, you know, growing up in the, in the U S and being able to get little, uh, get short videos from, um, you know, from Babcha in, in Poland, um, every day, um, saying good morning to you, uh, you know, during the early years of Facebook, um, I, I very much felt the community building power of it. I felt there was a way in which, you know, we've become, you know, years before the pandemic, we've become so isolated. So many people live nowhere near their families of origin and, um, and our lives are so separated from each other. And there was a quality in Facebook that I used to think of as sort of recreating the village, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, that, you know, in, in village life, if my family were still back in the shtetl, you know, I would, there would be 500 people that I would know kind of by name or face. And some of them would be close and I would, I would, I would keep track of them, but others, you know, I would find out if someone died or someone got married or someone had a baby and, and I was able to curate my own village. And there was something very, very beautiful about it that then, you know, shifted later on as I became much more aware of the, you know, how the algorithm keeps reinforcing um, what, what can be sold to me. But I really felt the potential of these platforms to bridge, um, to bridge isolation and to recreate something that in this moment of our culture, we've, we've so much lost. Um, and I see that in the, in this Marco Polo that you mentioned as well. Um, what, what if the currency is connection? What if the currency is creating, um, 
supportive space around you. Um, and you know, how can we, how can we make that happen? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a question in that, but it's just me going off thinking, um, because I loved yeah. that about it. And I've felt a loss about no longer trusting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's where you have, as we were saying, um, when those things aren't incentivized or built yeah, then, um, or people are totally at the whim of, um, a certain, certain norms and legal structures that, um, mean that they're maximizing profit, then we lose that as it scales. Right. Um, and this just brings me to something that I'm incredibly passionate about, which is that I believe that there are, um, uh, I know <laughs> that there are beautiful visions for the future and for how we may structure, um, systems that, and companies that incentivize our individual and collective well-being. Um, many of, and many of those visions and that expertise is coming from outside of Silicon Valley and particularly coming from BIPOC communities. Um, there's beautiful visions that young people have when we ask them what they would want technology to be like. Um, and I believe deeply that, um, if, if we support, and if I'll just say for myself, one of my missions in life is to, um, support those visions, um, actually being the driver of tech's next chapter. Um, and if we don't do that, and if we expect the solutions to come from within the silos of Silicon Valley, then I think we're screwed <laughs> basically. So, uh, th that makes me want to get a little bit more specific. There's been a request in the chat for us to get a little more concrete about what it is you do. So, you know, you said you're working with TikTok on creating these metrics and, uh, protecting and protecting and, um, cultivating for, for TikTok users. So how does that ha happen? Does the phone ring one day? Hello, this is TikTok. <laughs> or do you, are you going after companies and saying, this is what we can do this. You need this. How, how is this happening? It's a great question. I appreciate, I appreciate getting into the tactical. Sometimes I can be like, and then there's this. And, um, so you can think about our work in three primary buckets. Um, one is this community building that I mentioned, and I can speak a little bit to how that happens as well. But um, one is company advising, like what we're doing with TikTok. And then the final one is newer for us, but it's really around narrative. So it's telling the story of Tech's Next Chapter, lifting up the visions of those that are typically left out of the conversation, like I said. And we feel they all need to happen because... Um, the community is creating more of a sense of bravery. Um, it's people learning from each other, supporting each other. Um, and then the work inside of the companies is helping to manifest that concretely. Um, and then the, uh, the narrative work is helping to enable them through a story of how things could be. And your question specifically, I think was about the middle bucket, the advising piece. How does that happen? Um, actually, many of the advising engagements that we've had um, have come from people who are part of our community. And so they build trust with us. They understand that we have a wide network of, um, of experts and perspectives that, um, that they want to, they want it to be more seamless and easeful for those perspectives to, to come into their companies, but they also kind of experience our secret sauce, which is more of the spiritual side. Um, and that's not something when we go into, it's funny, we kind of code switch, right? Like when we're in the community, it is very much more explicitly like an action oriented Sangha to use Buddhist language. Um, uh, but, but then we have to kind of translate that sometimes into a company context, but they know that we get people into a place where they're more in touch with why this work matters with their responsibility as people who are shaping our humanity at such a scale. Um, and so, uh, like, so, so one way is by people who are part of our community, um, hiring us into their companies, um, to do that work. Um, and then it's like referrals, word spreads. Like we actually, um, we intentionally made the choice to be more in the background than for a while. Um, then for example, the center for humane technology, which was the main force behind the social dilemma movie. And they're like really out there sounding the alarm bell. And because we're in the realm of building trust amongst people who, where it's somewhat controversial that they're coming together, we want to make sure people believe that we're not just going to kind of, that, that um, 
we we trust that they can be different, right? And make different kinds of choices and um, that we're a partner for them in that. Um, while also having some fierceness, like not just being, you know, I think of myself sometimes as a, a fierce chaplain of the tech sector, um, valuing uh, life. <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, fierce chaplain of the tech sector. Which is what it takes. It's deep work to do things differently when we're inside of these swirling systems that value something that we feel on a deep level isn't right. But like, it's not always easy to figure out what's different or how to do things differently. So, um, the um, and so in in a way, you're moving kind of at the at the pace of trust. Yes, um, you're building trust in a kind of core community, and and it then um, it folks bring their tech companies with them into this relationship. And hopefully it comes to be honored in their, um, in the companies they work for. How lonely is your work? Um, are there, is there a movement, uh, globally around doing this? Who else is doing this, this work? It is not lonely work. It's, I mean, except being a founder of something is kind of lonely, but like that doesn't have to do with the, the, um, the nature of the work. I feel part of a, thriving, growing ecosystem of people that are dedicated to figuring out um, how to shift and rebalance technology and humanity. Um, many of those people, most of those groups, I would say, are doing it sort of from a, a standpoint of like, um, if you could think of it like within the bucket of sort of ethical, responsible tech, how do you technically do that? What are the governance structures? What's the policy? Um, uh, what are the teams that need to be in place to do things like handle misinformation and election protection and things like that, which is being pushed for outside and inside of the tech companies. Um, I have yet to come across any other groups that are really thinking about this from the perspective of bringing in um, particularly spiritual caretakers who understand that aspect of our lives um, to help inform product. Increasingly, you have things like well-being programs inside of tech companies where people are coming in to lead meditations. But this other piece of it that is recognizing that technologists are, because, because of the way that the things are building are mediating our lives, they are the de facto spiritual caretakers of our world. Um, which is like, I'll just pause on that for a second. It's like kind of, uh, scary because the training, the orientation, the moral responsibility that throughout human history has come with the role of being a rabbi, for example, um, being an, you know, an elder, a healer, a minister, those are not things that people learn in their computer science degree. Um, and yet the decisions that they make have such an influence over us. Like I said before, quite literally people are pleading to, speaking to Alexa as the only person for their suicidal pleas. So yeah. Yeah. therefore those that are building the algorithm are in the role of spiritual caretaker. Um, and that's one of the things that, uh, that is a frame that I have not heard anyone else, um, speak to. And that, um, that can be lonely because we're really bridging language too. Um, and like I said, we have to code switch all the time. And sometimes it's really hard even talking to funders when, um, there are certain funders where you just say the word meditation teacher and they think you're just a meditation program and, oh, you're just, you know, employee well-being, right? Like, which is important too, but like, um, this isn't serious stuff. And just, it's one of the reasons why I'm thrilled to talk to this community because I, because Commonweal is such an important um, place for me in terms of that wholeness that I can show up to, you know, really speak to um, the pieces of it that really have to do with that deep um, spiritual uh, element of how these tools are affecting our lives. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's challenging to imagine what how products might look might look different. I mean, you're a couple times now you've mentioned Alexa responding to uh, a suicidal plea, and that's a it's a harrowing image. And uh, as you think about it, you realize, yeah, um, you know that's that's there. Um, we use our you know we use our technologies um, all the time in ways that are you know cries for help. And our technologies aren't prepared to, to notice it and respond. Um, but you're not talking about building uh, meditation apps. You're not talking about something that overt. 
um, but rather some kind of inner wholeness mm -hmm. that um, that becomes manifest in other kind in games that you play and communication um, technology that you use. Um, do you have do you have a sense of just sort of what that might what that might look like? What are how would a future technology look different? Is that too 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 difficult a question? It's I just I'm just trying to wrap my brain around what is the next you know Facebook kind of thing, and how does it look different if we feel like the developers represent a more diverse um, group of people, bringing a more diverse bunch of concerns, and that they're also engaged in their own spiritual development as they're doing this work. How might we see the effect? Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, such a good question, Erwin. And one of the challenges of, um, of this work is that it's, it's hard to envision. It's much easier to write the negative narrative of the future than to write the positive narrative of the future. Um, and I guess I would, I would speak to some of like going back to the videos I showed of TikTok, right? There are things like that, that, um, that truly do bring people together that create joy, um, particularly at a time when, um, you know, during the pandemic, it was so important for people to feel joy and to feel connected to people around the world. Um, but it also just loads minute and a half videos after minute and a half videos after minute and a half videos. And whenever, like for this work, I've had to spend some time on TikTok and it's whatever I do, I feel completely disembodied. It's like, I kind of suddenly, even after just a couple of videos, I kind of look around, I'm like, where am I? What planet am I on? Do I have a body, <laughs> you know? And, um, and also you see situations where, um, I'll get back to describing your question, but you see situations where, for example, the algorithm starts to get to know you a certain way, but what if you change? Like, what if somebody is in recovery from an eating disorder and all of their videos on TikTok are um, showing them dieting videos and like fasting videos and all these things, but then they're in recovery and they don't want to see those anymore but the algorithm doesn't know that. <laughs> and so their only choice is to kind of go off the platform as opposed to having agency and saying, I don't want to see that anymore. I'm going to re I'm just going to press the reset button for this algorithm, you know, and like start over, you know, and have more control over, over what, um, what I'm seeing, how it's affecting me. Um, and so I think there's a couple of things there's getting away from the, um, mechanisms that try to keep us on the platform. So like, there's little things like TikTok doesn't have to keep showing me videos, right? They can create more friction for that. Um, what do you mean and, by create more friction for that? What, what I mean is that, mean? that like, I have to actually intentionally select, I want to see another video, which YouTube doesn't do. They just keep playing it, which Netflix doesn't do. They just keep playing it. They make it so that we have to exert self-control um, in order to stop it as opposed to the opposite where we have to actively say, I want this. And, um, so that's one category. The other is really going back to this agency and control piece where, um, right now I feel that many of us, many of us feel at the effect of the technology in the sense of it really is playing to, you know, as, um, they say in the social realm of the bottom of the brainstem. Um, and, and yet, if we were able to truly say, here's what I value and here's the kind of relationship I want to have to technology and that the technology actually helps reinforce that. Um, one of the things that was really interesting, we were doing an advising engagement for Alexa um, that was around the fact that um, Alexa is increasingly, uh, this was well before the pandemic, the only companion for a lot of elderly people. And meanwhile, there's an epidemic of loneliness um, uh, amongst the elderly in the United States. And when I say companion, I kind of, you know, mean that as like, not, that's not necessarily a good thing, but, <laughs> um, but it's right. kind of true. Um, yeah. and, and so, uh, we brought in a handful of meditation teachers and caretakers to really help them think creatively about how Alexa might, um, help decrease loneliness amongst the elderly by consciously designing for ways that, um, Alexa could optimize, um, for connection 
And so for instance, some of the, yeah, some of the concrete <laughs> ideas that came up were um, that uh, actually Sharon Salzberg, the meditation teacher asked, well, is there a way that Alexa can like solicit um, questions, uh, whether it's from family members or the person themselves about what they value most and, and how they want to spend their time and then to, to optimize for that? Or are there ways that Alexa could um, play you know, mu music from the person's childhood when they, they want that? Or particularly, you find that music can be really powerful for people with dementia. Um, or could, could Alexa um, be cued to collect stories from, um, from people about their lives by sort of that can then be available for the families? Um, or if someone's stuck in their house that Alexa could um, oftentimes has a video function and could know, oh, well, you're really passionate about knitting, um, just to be sorry, typical about the elderly, sorry about that, but like, you're really passionate about knitting or you're really passionate about, you know, gardening that you used to be able to do. Um, and let's match you up with someone else who's also stuck in their home mm. and you can talk about that. Um, mm. So... There are ways to, you know, come up with beautiful ideas um, for connection um, and for helping people live the lives that we determine we want to live. Because that's one of the things that I think is so sad about technology is that it actually so often keeps us from being the person we want to be. Because, you know, for example, my values are that I want to, I want to be able to be with hard things. I don't want to numb myself out. I want to notice when I'm you know, kind of, um, not the person that I want to be or, um, but I do notice that sometimes in those moments, if I'm not like, if I'm tired or I'm whatever, I just like go to Instagram, you know, and I never yeah. feel better after that. Um, uh, we, we work with a neuroscientist named Dan Siegel who, um, talks about, uh, a lot of these tools, uh, being the potato chip of connection where it's like, <laughs> Uh, it's so salty. I love it. Oh my God. But I also hate it. And then you finish and you're like, that was terrible. And I don't feel nurtured. At, I don't feel nourished at all. And I feel, you know, and that's sort of, I think, but it's tempting. So this idea how do we make it, how do we make it nourishing food? Basically, and the fostering of connection, the connect, this idea of Alexa connecting, you know, uh, people who have similar interests. I mean, there's a piece of it that's scary that Alexa would know so much about us and about so much about so many people to be able to do that, um, to be sort of the concierge of our social experience. At the same time, um, you know, this is, Alexa does know all this stuff. So how right. do we, how do we, how do we put it in service of um, fuller living and connection, you know, in this, in, in this pandemic, you know, the, what, the way that so many people have pushed forward in their ability to work with technology has been, has been incredible. And I've noticed in my rabbinic work with my synagogue that as soon as we, as soon as we went to an online platform for having worship, um, and you know, there are all of the complaints that I hear all the time, but we can't sing together, blah, 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 all the, it's, this is what's hard about it. It, um, we grew exponentially because people were able to connect so easily um, into with, into real time with other people that they share something with. That um, getting in a car on a Friday night um, and driving somewhere to do that to do something similar was uh, presented too big an obstacle um, for elders, for people that are working and are trying to quickly shower and eat and go back out. It's, it, there are, um, you know, we've created busy lives and isolated lives that make physical coming together, um, problematic, uh, challenging at times. And there was an ease that was introduced that, um, was and continues to be beautiful. People being able mm -hmm. to share a space, being able to glimpse into each other's homes as you and I are doing mm -hmm. right now, which brings with it another element of our humanity, another way of sharing that we never would have seen each other's homes otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, uh, it, it feels to me like there is such potential for warmth and intimacy available through platforms 
if they become available, if they become um, easily accessible, equally accessible across socioeconomics, um, and um, and if they have an incentive to bring us in and and make that happen for us. Yeah, totally. Yeah, two things I'd love to say about that. Um, one is just that I want to encourage people to um, really remember those positive ac- aspects of technology so that we can paint the picture of like, what is the world that optimizes for these positive aspects? Because the genie's out of the bottle, as you said, like Alexa is in many people's homes. These algorithms do understand, I mean, understand so much about us. And I also, at the same time, want to encourage people to get offline as much as possible. You know, I'm totally all for that too. Um, but yeah, to your, to your specific example, or when we actually this summer did a project with, um, the union for reform Judaism, which as you know, is, um, an umbrella organization for all the reform rabbis in the country. And that was an unusual advising engagement for us because all of our other engagements have been for tech companies. And this one instead was bridging the other direction where, URJ and the rabbis that are part of that community were really saying, well, how do we offer up an experience for the high holidays in, um, in the fall that is meaningful for people? Um, and maybe actually isn't just good enough, but it isn't just let's put the service on zoom and call it a day, but that really thinks about, well, how can this be an opportunity to bring people back to the deeper meaning of the high holy days? Um, and so we actually, um, your wonderful husband, Oren was part of, uh, was one of the people who we brought in to help them think creatively about that. Um, and I was very inspired during that project by, um, something that my uncle, who's a reformed rabbi, Sam Gordon in Chicago told me when I was at the divinity school, um, and writing a sermon, uh, which was about how the tradition of Shabbat, where we come together around the table, and Arun, I'm sure you know this story, but that, that that way of observing Shabbat really only happened after the burning of the second temple in Israel, when we as Jews were um, taken to Babylon and became slaves. And so there was no longer a place that was like, here's the temple, you go here, God is here, um, and you worship here, and then everywhere else is sort of the rest of the world. It was actually the way you access God and you access spirit was around our tables together in community. And that's how Shabbat, as we know it, which I believe is one of the most beautiful, uh, it's my favorite um, uh, ritual actually um, of Judaism. Um, That's how it was formed. It was through limitation. And so the question we were posing was like, well, how can the limitations of this time um, help us to reinvent things, knowing that there are a lot of things lost. We can't sing together in the same way. And that's really hard. Um, but we also can, uh, use this as a moment to like, ask the question of, you know, how can, how can the limitations actually enable us? There's a a couple of questions in the chat. I'm going to do the most recent one just because it, it builds off of what you're saying right now. Uh, Bob Webb is saying, um, Uh, that he loves the idea of connecting people, especially if that can carry over into physical connection. I'm wondering if you have a few ideas on how that can be accomplished, how to move from a digital platform into the real world. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I mean, I think there are, there are numerous examples um, of that, of, things that have existed for a long time, like the meetup platform, for example, which, um, was an early, I mean, in some ways like social network, um, that was started by a group of people that were very values oriented. Um, we actually did a a lot of work with them when we were at the white house. Um, but the idea there is that you, that you identify, um, people, people self-create, uh, groups to come together, whether it's for playing Frisbee or, you know, doing a cleanup day at the local park or all sorts of things. And then people come together around these, um, uh, these, you know, shared areas of interest, um, in real life. And there's so many things like that, or, you know, I think we don't really have, we don't really have couch surfing anymore, but back pre 
um, Airbnb, there was the platform of couch surfing where people would find other people's homes to, to go and stay in, um, as a generosity exchange. Um, so there's a lot of things like that. Um, and you find many examples of that too, like, you know, on Facebook and places like that too. It, you know, there can be predatory things that happen as well that, you know, we need to be really careful of. Um, and there's all sorts of scary stories about, um, you know, children, uh, or like young women being taken into, um, uh, you know, even like child slavery and, uh, Mm. you know, like, so it's, so there's precautions that really need to be taken, um, around all that, but, um, it's true. I think taking that, um, taking those connections and, and taking them in person, uh, when possible can be really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm wondering, Erwin, like if you have examples of that from, uh, you know, as, as you've been putting more online as a, for your congregation, like, how do you think about that? Um, well, we've provided lots more ways for people to connect, but it's all been through video platforms. Mm -hmm. Um, we haven't yet begun to, uh, get back together. So it'll be, this is going to be a project for the future of, uh, you know, we're going to be continuing to do things in digital platforms because it's so accessible. Um, and we've found ways to create tremendous intimacy and warmth. Uh, but also then how do we make it possible for, okay, those of you who live in this area, in potluck on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that's something we're, we're going to be just, that we're really just beginning to look at. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, there are more questions bubbling up. Stephanie comments as an elder and consumer and a consumer of media, how do we exert more pressure on the existing formats like Facebook that have such a stranglehold on the market? Is there a policy being established to support the kind of agency that you're talking about? Um, how do we support upward movement from ground level and simultaneously redirect the profit driven top down stuff. And she humorously says, my deleting Facebook hasn't really had much impact. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Especially when you look globally, I mean, it's one thing for the U S market to start to protest these tools and get off of them, but they really have such a massive reach around the world. Um, it's a really good question. I honestly think that there's a real latent opportunity for more consumer organizing that hasn't really happened yet. Um, and you know, I would love to see happen with technology, the tech sector, what we see, what we've seen happen with food, um, where people started to realize that eating healthy food is really important. And so there's demand for it and brands are responding to it. And, um, there's more and more of an emphasis on affordability of getting really healthy food to low income communities. And, you know, and so, so much of that was driven by consumer demand. Um, and yet there isn't right now a clear cut forum to express that demand at scale. And that's one of the things I'm hopeful will, um, will really shift, um, before too long. There also is policy on the horizon. I do believe I'm, I'm not, I'd be more privy to it if I were still working in government in the White House. But um, I think we're going to see, particularly during the Biden administration, some much more bold um, accountability mechanisms, whether that's antitrust and, you know, making sure that these companies are, are broken up and not becoming these sort of um, mega uh, monopolies. monopolies. Yeah. Um, and that'll go a long way, but it also doesn't fix the problem. And I'm every time I talk to somebody that's really engaged with tech policy, I make a plug for also making it easier for people to do things differently, that we really regulate the harms and we enable the zebras of the world. So so this is going to bring me to a question that was in the chat quite some time ago from Rosa, um, which, uh, you know, is on all of our minds that um, the social media platforms have revealed such a dark side in recent years, especially given the, the, their contributions to anti-democracy. So um, how do we enhance the positive opportunities? So that's, you know, like the uh, healthy food, what is, what, is, what is the alternative to just trying to regulate out disinformation? Um, what is the, the positive side of, of what we might need to and be able to do? In terms of... Um... Like, what's the strategy for doing those things, or what is it? 
Well, I, uh, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of curious, like what, what becomes in a, you know, in a, in a world where tech is responding to our needs and including our spiritual, emotional, um, intellectual needs, what does a uh, political discussion maybe look like mm-hmm. or political mm-hmm. content? Mm-hmm. It might be, that's, I mean, that's, a, that's a whole other new school talk. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a. um, Or what might a platform look like mm -hmm. that can hold complexity in that way? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, Yeah, and it's so much of going back to the origin of why I'm doing this work, being in the Obama administration when Trump was elected and really seeing, like, oh my gosh, technology has divided us in this way, not to mention things like Cambridge Analytica, but like, um, really polarization being so amplified, um, the spread of misinformation, obviously, which we've seen throughout the whole Trump administration in a major way. Um, and so that, that is one of the reasons that I became passionate about this work. Um, in terms of what, uh, what does it look like to actually, um, shift that? I'll just say one thing that gives me hope is that uh, these companies, you know, in a reactive way, unfortunately, but um, most of them, as I've said before, have teams that are dedicated to asking that question um, and really trying to address things like misinformation. They're much earlier on the enhan- enhancing the positive, I would say, like enhancing a sense of um, or addressing othering, like enhancing a sense of uh, empathy on the platforms and um we actually uh, have teamed up with an organization called New Public that used to be called Civic Signals that's led by somebody named Eli Pariser who actually developed the term the filter bubble um, years ago and uh, wrote a book called Filter Bubble, which is basically the idea that mm. al- algorithms make us into an echo chamber um, and we get siloed from each other and have different realities and different senses of the truth. And what they're now doing is they're really taking what we've learned about how to build healthy public spaces offline in cities, in parks, like learning from urban planners. Um, And uh, Jane Jacobs applied to technology and really trying to help create exchange amongst technologists and those who have done this in physical spaces. And so um, they talk about creating technology that's welcoming, that's hospitable, that is creates joy. Um, and so we're actually doing some workshops with them for technologists that we're super excited about. Um, so you could just imagine the, you know, best example of a park that brings together diverse, uh, uh, people from diverse backgrounds, or one of my favorites is the farmer's market at Oak in Oakland at Lake Merritt, where, um, for those of you that don't live around here and haven't been there, um, it's just like, the most vibrant, diverse, um, setting with music and, you know, produce and all these things and food trucks. And I don't know exactly what it looks like to put that online, but I do know that we're not going to figure it out unless we have people who have done that offline helping to inform it. So, um, I hope that isn't sort of a cop-out answer because I don't, there's not, um, you know, it's, I'm, I feel like a lot of my role in the world is to help make those connections to those that have really done this in a beautiful way offline. Certainly if there were a simple fix, we would know what it is and we would be lobbying for it. Um, but this idea of how to sort of create the, how to, uh, foster the creative space where this can happen, uh, Mm -hmm. where the new ideas can arise. And I love this idea of taking, um, uh, you know, what's learned in physical space and applying it to cyberspace. Mm-hmm. Um, what do we learn from the farmer's market and from the town square and from the park um, yeah. is really, it, it's beautiful and it heartens me. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel, yeah. I'm feeling in my body kind of a sense of <sighs> relief, mm-hmm. just, just imagining that those conversations are happening and one of the things that you've reminded me before, um, you know, is uh, it's important not to see tech companies, whether they're startups or whether they're, you know, the, you know, what's now, I guess, the the blue chip vintage tech companies, <laughs> <laughs> but but n- not to see them as sort of monoliths of people who are all alike. 
you know, the work you do in drawing people together and doing um, spiritual work across companies, you know, reminds us that, that these, and as you said before in this conversation, these are real human beings making real decisions every day. And, um, and that, and that reminder gives me a lot of hope. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Especially as I get to know them. Um, yeah, as humans that really do care about this and that I'll just say again, going back to our work in terms of community building, it really is beautiful to see how, um, how powerful community can be for people to, to lock arms, um, together and be courageous. And I actually, I'd love to read a quote, uh, that we've been really inspired by, by Thich Nhat Hanh, the, um, Vietnamese Buddhist monk who says, talking about a Sangha, so the Buddhist community, um, the Sangha is not a place to hide in order to avoid your responsibilities. The Sangha is a place to practice for the transformation and the healing of self and society. When you are strong, you can be there in order to help society. If your society is in trouble, if your family is broken, if your church is no longer capable of providing you a spiritual life, you work to take refuge in the Sangha so that you can restore your strength, your understanding, your compassion, your confidence. And then you, then in turn, you can use that strength, understanding and compassion to rebuild your family and society, to renew your church, to restore community and harmony. This can only be done in community, not as individual, but as a Sangha. Mm. I just, I love that. It's like so true. Yeah. This, this piece I want to speak to is just like, how do you create the conditions for people to make compassionate and courageous choices, um, who are doing this work and, um, it really goes back to the inner, right? We talked, I talked a lot about the inner and the outer and the Mobius strip. Um, and you do see a lot of meditation making its way, for example, into Silicon Valley. But unfortunately, there's a risk that that is um, what I sometimes call and others call spiritual bypassing. Yeah. That's using using these spiritual practices as a way to numb, as a way to not feel hard things, as a way to Maybe you feel uncomfortable about building a tool that then you don't like Facebook that you don't allow your kids to be on because you know it's bad for them. But maybe if you just meditate enough, you'll kind of like be able to not pay attention to that and you'll think you're fine. Um, when in fact, these practices are meant to be a force for um, compassion and um, and and courage right? and wisdom. Um, and so we think a lot about how to um, to shift that to 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 actually yeah, take these practices and, and, and use them as a force for compassion and wisdom. And, um, one of the reasons, or one of the things I think about with regards to that is again, going offline in Chinese gardens, they, um, uh, traditionally, uh, will build bridges across rivers and creeks that are at right angles so that if you aren't paying attention, you literally fall into the water. (laughs) And so I think about that with regards to designing (laughs) technology that like, how do we create opportunities for pause and reflection about what are the unintended consequences that could happen down the line um, from these tools. And you do see some of that happening within tech companies. And that's one of the things that we hope TikTok may also start to do. Or um, Also, I you know really am inspired by examples like the Quaker practice of sitting silently, follow, followed by speaking while moved. And that, that people oftentimes talk about that practice being one of the reasons why Quakers had the clarity and the bravery to be some of the first white abolitionists. So like, if we really go there, like thinking outside of what might be possible, um, and, Mm. uh, and acting more courageously. So, Mm. yeah, you have a little video to show us and we'll close with that. Okay. Yeah. So this video is within the bucket of what we call our narrative work that is um, really about lifting up visions for text future um, that come from communities that um, typically aren't necessarily um, uh, heard. And I'll also say this connects to um, your question, um, Erwin, about uh, what does it look like to create, you know, kinder, more compassionate spaces online and, uh, not just asking urban planners, I feel, but also um, asking children. So that's what we are going to show you is this little video we created of um, a message from the future. If you had a wish, what would you wish technology 
could do for the world. Be looking and help the world be stronger and stronger. So what do you think technology should be like when you're a grown-up? It would like to be helping my kids have fun yeah. and helping myself have fun. What is your wish for technology for the world? So if you guys don't know, I love giraffes. See, I even have giraffe headbands. But I, there's only one albino left in the world, which I think is really, really sad. And so I think that maybe they could help save giraffes somehow. I still don't know. I'm still coming up with an idea of how they could help save giraffes, but I know they could. The last question is, what is technology worthy of human spirit? I don't quite know what that question is, but I'm guessing what can te technology do to help humans? I should not, I should not watch any more shows. And I should, and I should show my kids that they should be a good listener yeah. and listen to their parents. What do you wish technology would do for the Ice world? Ice cream. Mm. <laughs> Ice cream. I should have just said that in response to all your questions around what does this look like. <laughs> so, so beautiful. Thank you. Um, um, Aiden, what, uh, I mean, always, what a treat to, to listen to you, how your mind works, what you bring to this world, and a pleasure to have you here at the New School. Um, Kira, let me turn it back over to you. Thank you. Erwin and Aiden, thank you again for being with us today. I love the reminder, Aiden, when you said that our attention is the most valuable commodity in the world. That's a beautiful thing to keep in mind. So again, we'll have the recordings produced of this conversation. And then I will say one more time, please consider making a donation to help us keep these programs going. Each donation is just so important to us. Thank you if you already have donated. And uh, we will see you next time. Erwin Keller and Aiden Van Noppen, thank you for being with us at the New School at Commonweal.